So do you believe that that was the best game Justin Fields has played as a passer, the one that we just saw against the Falcons? Uh, you know, hard, hard to think back and say it's his best, but I, but I did think there was definitely some some positives there. And, you know, I think we continue to see some really, really good moments from Justin Fields. Um, we continue to see the playmaker about every week. Uh, but from the passing standpoint, uh, you, there's some glimpses. There's some some really good things that you're seeing. And, you know, some really good throws in the weather and in the snow. Um, it was fun to watch. Uh, you know, now I think it's for all of us is, has it been enough? Has it been enough because of where the Bears are going to be picking for you to commit to Justin Fields? Because if you commit to him, you have to believe it's going to be committing to him long term and with a big contract. And you believe he is that guy over, you know, whoever you like, you know, at the top of the draft. So uh, it's going to be very interesting. I know everybody around the league is is talking about it. But, um, you know, the thing that you love is that you're seeing, you know, you're still seeing movement forward from Justin Fields, which is exactly what you want to see from a young guy is continuing to move forward. The question really just becomes, have you seen enough to say, hey, we can build around this guy, we can be a playoff team, and we can win championships with Justin Fields behind center. You know, I thought I knew where I was uh, before this week, Kurt. It, it's I was asked about it last week and informed by some of the conversations we've had. Just, you know, I, I don't know that the speed of his decision-making and his ability to fire the ball quickly at the end of his drop back, some of the pocket stuff, the anticipatory throws, it hasn't been good enough. Um, but then certain games, you're like, man, you see the whole picture of it. Do I mean, do other people's opinions go back and forth on fields that you talk to around the league? Because it's happening a lot in this town. A lot of our listeners and Bears fans find themselves kind of going back and forth on Justin. Yeah, I don't know if you hear a lot of guys go back and forth outside of just the fact that you know, there's certain games where his production is ridiculous. And, you know, at the end of the day, the position, any position is about production. So the production goes, you know, through the roof sometimes. I think most of the people that I talk to that, that truly understand the position continue to ask those same sort of questions that you're talking about and that, that I talk about every week is that, you know, I believe there's, uh, again, there's a threshold for being a starting quarterback or a franchise quarterback. And you got to get to that threshold however you have to get to that threshold. And so if it's more playmaker than passer, okay, great. You know, and so the question becomes, has Justin Fields reached that threshold? And, you know, that 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 accumulates to, to winning. That accumulates to consistency. That accumulates to making the right decisions and throws when you have to make those decisions and throws. And so people, I think, get enamored with the production part of it, which I think we all see. I mean, there's there's times where his production is, is through the roof and, and you say, man, if we could get that every week, there's no doubt, but you just don't see it. And when most of that production, you know, and again, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say most of it, but a lot of that production at times is the playmaking aspect, which is great. But I think you always have to look at that and say, can you live in that world? If you're a great playmaker, can you be a great playmaker every week and give us a chance to win? Can you be a great playmaker for the next five years every week? Or does some of that diminish? And, you know, do, do you lack that? If you, if you suffer one injury, now do you have to play a different way? And if you have to play a different way, can you win a different way? And that to me becomes the, the entire dilemma when we're talking about Tremendous playmakers. You know, I think Lamar Jackson is a great example, is that early in his career, tremendous playmaker. We didn't get to see him as more of this drop back type passer. We're seeing more of that this year. And, you know, I made a comment two weeks ago against San Francisco that he played very much off schedule in that game. And there was a lot of things in front of him that he didn't hit. But I've seen him hit those things on time, you know, in different games. He just wasn't hitting them in that game. But He's this dynamic playmaker, and it didn't matter because he ran around and made a bunch of plays. Then we go to this past week, and he played on schedule, and he played within the structure of the offense, and the team puts up 56 points, and he has a perfect passer rating. And so with Lamar Jackson, you get all of the special, but you also have a quarterback that you believe can win another way. If, if, if he doesn't have to be that guy, 
He can play on schedule. He can make those throws. And that's exactly what you want to see or you want to know is can Justin be that guy? And I don't know if any of us have an answer to that yet. And that's where the dilemma falls is because, again, if the Bears were picking late in the first round where they're not going to get one of the top guys, you know, I think it's a completely different conversation saying, okay, maybe we've we've seen enough. We don't need to reach for another quarterback because we have Justin. Let's give him another year. But when you're picking at the top of the draft and you've got these other guys that everybody thinks are are really good and, and, and possibly franchise quarterbacks there, that's where the dilemma comes to the forefront. We put the spotlight on it. We have to say and answer that question is, have we seen enough of that other stuff to say, if that's who we have to be, we can win that way. Or just kind of understanding the, you know, the, the scope of the league is that we haven't seen very many tremendously athletic playmakers live in that world and and compete deep into the playoffs, you know, and win championships. We haven't seen that. It still goes through the pocket, in my opinion, especially when you play against good teams in the playoffs every week, you've got to beat people in the pocket. That's going to be the knock on Lamar Jackson until he changes that narrative is that he's been really good in the regular season. He's won an MVP, but he hasn't been able to do it in the pocket. And so in playoff time, I think he's one and three in the playoffs against those good teams that take away some of that playmaking and forced him to play more conventional quarterback. I think that will be different this year because he's grown into that. That to me is, is again, the dilemma or the question that we have with Justin. We're talking to Kurt Warner, Parkins, and Spiegel on the score. Jordan Love is four months older than Justin Fields. Who is going to be the better quarterback over the next 10 years? I mean, again, I mean, if I'm going based off of, you know, just what I've seen every game this year, I'm going to say Jordan Love. And now I would probably say that Jordan Love doesn't have, you know, that top level upside from the athletic standpoint, from the arm strength, special kind of throw standpoint. But when I look at consistency by which, He sees the game. He plays the game. He makes decisions. I've seen a better Jordan Love this year, week in and week out, than I've seen from Justin Fields. And there hasn't been as many wild plays, but consistency of playing the position, um, I think Jordan Love has been solid this year. You know, there's things he can clean up. There's things he's got to get better at, no question. But I think he's been really, really solid this year, and, and he's gotten better as time has gone along and, you know, the other narrative with that, and and we can make the narrative with Justin too, is that he hasn't always had the great playmakers and and talent around him, um, you know, throughout his career. Jordan loved playing with a lot of young guys that are growing and learning, and he's been able to do this and grow and get this team in a position to make the playoffs. Um, I just, I I really like what I've seen from him in his first action. um, And I'm excited to see where he can go from here. So we will see, obviously, that's the decision. That's, you know, everyone, people are texting in. If, if Kurt Warner was the GM, what would you decide? I mean, do you know? Do you have a – are you ready to say? Would you – because they, they, um, they are locked into the number one pick, Kurt. If you – if it was up to you, and you haven't done your full background, you haven't done all the interviews, I understand that. But are you yeah. ready to say what you would do if you were Ryan Pulse? Well, I mean, I, I think, again, to me is I haven't had all the questions answered from Justin. So if I felt there was another quarterback in this draft um, that I felt could be that guy, you know, that he was off the charts in in whatever I was looking for and whatever I believe made a franchise quarterback, and I was picking number one overall, I would probably have to go that route just because there's still questions about Justin. And, you know, it might not be fair to Justin uh, because he's gotten better and he's shown us things and Maybe he just needs another year or two. I just think it's a unique situation if you're picking number one overall. Yep. And you have the pick of the litter at the quarterback position with guys that, and again, I haven't watched these college guys. So I'm I'm not ready to say, oh, yeah, three of these guys I believe are are franchise quarterbacks or, you know, can be better than Justin. I haven't watched them enough to know that. But just from what I hear, people seem to think that this quarterback class could be really, really special. And you could, there could be more than one of those guys that's there. And I think if, if you believe one of them's there and you're the number one pick, 
um, that you probably have to go that route if you're not fully convinced on Justin Fields. And it it just you know doesn't seem to me that anybody is fully convinced. And again, I, I don't want this to be a knock on Justin because I think he's done some good things. It's just timing, situation, I think it lends itself to say, you got to be sure. You got to be 100% sure he is that guy. If he is, great. Go get some other talented guys at the top of the draft, surround him, and, and you guys could be really good. But if you don't, I think you have to go the quarterback route. He he doesn't yet have that on-schedule consistency, that anticipatory throwing consistency. That that's That's doubtless. What we do know that he does have – Having watched for three years as closely as we have, he has what your buddy Trent Dilfer told us was the stuff bucket overflowing. He's professional. He's mature. His teammates love him. He does learn stuff. He works his ass off. Like all of those kind of things, which are so difficult to scout. How much should it matter, Kurt, that we know that stuff about him? Well, I think all of that stuff matters. I think all of that stuff is huge. I and I said it, I think a week ago, you know, when I'm talking about Jared Goff and that just that, you know, he's led two different teams to, you know, to, uh, I think, division championships or the playoffs after 10 year droughts. I mean, and a big part of that is leadership and guys around you believing in you. That, that stuff is huge. But again, at the end of the day, you can have all that stuff, but you got to do it on the field. You, you've got to be able to produce the way that we need you to produce to give up, you know, that, that winning performance every single week. Uh, and for us to believe you can do that moving forward, that overrides all of these other great things. Like you said, I want a hard worker. I want a tremendous leader. I want a guy that people are going to battle for. But more importantly, I want the guy that goes between the lines and makes the plays we need him to make, whatever that looks like. We need him to make for us to be successful and win or give a winning performance every time out. Um, and, and that, to me, is where all of that stuff falls. You know, that, that stuff bucket is great. But at the end of the day, we want a guy that can play. We want a guy that can do those things. And, uh, again, you know, I think Justin's played better, and this team has played better down the stretch, which even clouds this stuff even more, yep. um, you know, because they've played better as of late. And will that skew things – in the direction of kind of standing pat, adding some more talent, and, and the building around Justin Fields, yet to be known. But uh, but again, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, teams are going to look at performance on the field, and if they believe that performance is the kind of performance ca that can lead them to the playoffs and two championships, that will override all of those other things in ninety percent of the time. How close is the Bears roster two through fifty three, removing the quarterback from it? to being championship worthy in your mind? Uh, I, I think they're, they've got a ways to go offensively. Uh, obviously, DJ is, you know, a huge piece. So they've got a guy that, uh, you know, is a number one wide receiver. But I, I think they need some, some better secondary players, some difference makers around him to help Justin. Um, you know, I think they can improve, obviously, the running game and, and get more explosive there. I think their defense has played – really, really well down the stretch. I mean, they've played really, really good football. Um, you know, so I really like what they're doing though there, even though they don't have a lot of household names on that defense. But I think offensively from a roster standpoint, because that's the other part of it, is that when you're a quarterback and you're asked to have to do everything for your team, you know, have to make every play and every throw, that's a hard position to be in. And, and it sure feels like for the most part, whether it's him – with design runs or him having to buy time and then run around or whether it's him making the perfect throw, he's got to make a lot of plays for this team, which is, you know, often unfair to these guys too, to get a full judgment because you're not getting a lot of easy plays and, and a lot of help on the outside of you. Um, but again, there's just not the luxury to always have that situation, but I do think their roster offensively is a ways away from being, uh, you know, a championship type contender. On Saturday night, Kurt, um, Dan Campbell tried to confuse the Cowboys and he confused the refs and Br and Brad Allen. Um, did the Lions get jobbed on that or because they were trying to confuse the opposition, does that do they do they get what what happened to them? Uh, do they deserve it? I mean, I don't think you ever deserve it. I think there's always a part of gamesmanship that you try to pull off. Um you know, to, to be able to gain an advantage. Uh, I 
you know, with the way that it all played out and the way it looked on film, I think the officials have to do a better job of, of, you know, figuring it out. Now, you know, I can see, you know, when you, when you kind of look back and see what happened and you looked earlier in the game that Skipper had come in and reported eligible a couple times, you know, Dan Campbell had told him before the game, Hey, we're going to do something special where we bring somebody in and we make somebody eligible. So all that stuff's going on in your mind. And then Skipper's running right at the, uh, the official coming in. Yeah, I understand why he's like, Oh, here he comes again. Oh, it could be one of their special plays that they talked about. He's eligible, yet the guy that's supposed to be eligible is standing right there, and Panay Sewell is standing right there. Why is he standing there? Because he's not asking to be eligible. So, yeah, I think there was a lot of chaos going on. But at the end of the day, I think the official needs to kind of stop there and go, let's get this right. We know that they had a special play, you know, that Dan Campbell had talked to us about. Let's stop. Let's ask. Let's get this right. And if it ruins, you know, the, the element of surprise, it ruins the element of surprise, but we get it right. So we don't have a situation like this transpire because man, when we're looking back at it now and who knows if, if they do it right and everybody on the defense knows that 68 is eligible, maybe it doesn't work out the same way, but just in the big picture of things, that one play and how that played out is having such a dramatic effect on what the NFC playoffs are going to look like, who's going where, what seed in, you know, all these teams have a chance to, to have. I mean, it's just, it's crazy how that illuminate that one play illuminates so much um, that you just want at the end of the day, just everybody to stop and get it right. Kurt, as always, thank you. Happy new year. We'll talk to you after bears and Packers. Thank you, sir.